This is Upwell, a new podcast from Only One, featuring entrepreneurs, advocates, and leaders working to protect and restore the ocean and the planet. And I'm your host, Aaron Kinnery. Today, we have Angelique Pompano, who is the policy advisor to the chair of the Alliance of Small Island States and has an incredible range of experience in financing climate adaptation and resilience. Let's dive in. Angelique, it's great to see you and thank you for joining Upwell. You're currently advising the Alliance of Small Island States. What are some of the key priorities of this alliance and how are the members working together? Yeah, no, thanks for inviting me, Aaron. Um, So I I am a policy and strategy advisor to the Alliance of Small Island States. Um, Our priorities this year, um, it's based on um, three thematic areas. The first, sustainable development, ocean, as well as climate change. As it relates to climate, of course, it's a big year for for the climate uh, sphere with having the first ever global stock take, um, having um, ratified the Paris Agreement um, and having it entered into force since 2016. So this has been dubbed the report card of the world. Um, We're going to see if we're at an A, B, C, D, E, F or or U perhaps. Um, So that's, that's on the front for climate on plastics is also... Um, a, a, a really important year as it relates to closing the uh, legally binding agreement on marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, we are in IGC 5 resumed. Um, hopefully we can um, close that and really offer the, the hope that is needed um, and the framework that is needed to address um, threats to marine biodiversity. Um, in areas beyond national jurisdictions, uh, we also have the plastics um, um negotiations going on, in working towards a global treaty on plastics. And finally, it's a big year for small islands because um, we had a 10-year Samoa pathway. Uh, the pathway, <laughs> the 10 years comes to an end next year. Um, and now we are doing the legwork to take us through to the next era for, for SIDS, which will be taking place in um, 2024, where we will have the UN SIDS conference in, in likely to be Antigua and Barbuda. And often when we discuss climate change, we hear dates that are decades into the future. But for small island states, climate catastrophes are very much a present day reality. What are some of the climate related challenges that small islands are facing today? Yeah, I think I think you're right in in the sense that um, for for islands, it's not, you know, it's not in the future. It's really in the in the in the present, in the now. Um, And there are many different challenges. impacts uh, to the adverse effects of climate change. And these, you know, these vary, they include the erosion of already very vulnerable coastlines. Um, as uh, many know, island nations are often very low lying um, island atolls and or island um, uh, features. And, and oftentimes they, they, they're very susceptible to sea level rise and coastal erosion. Um, this, of course, uh, affects not only the you know the availability of land in itself, which is where we we are able to put up um, critical infrastructure, um, but also uh, with the with the creeping in of salt water into into land, which typically could have been used for agriculture. This leads to salt intrusion and, of course, threatening food security. And food security is a big one um, for island nation, and so is water security. To be fair. When it comes to food security, another aspect that, you know, climate change is really doing us a, a harsh, it's really creating a harsh reality is, of course, it's it's attack on our um, coastal ecosystems. And here I'm thinking about coral reefs in particular um, that are being dissolved by ocean acidification or bleaching um, because of high water temperatures. Um, and when, it, when I say an attack on our coastal ecosystems, it's not, it's it's an attack on our coastal ecosystems, which is very important, but at the same time, it's also meaning that the diverse, the biodiversity that lives amongst there gets displaced and inherently the livelihoods that they support, whether it is tourism, whether it's small scale fisheries, they too get displaced, um, leading to a lot of impacts on, on the human population, both in terms of food security, but livelihoods as well. Um, Aaron, honestly, I, I could go on. Um, there are many impacts to small island nations. Of course, it's an existential threat for many. Um, that are facing the the real threats that uh, they could no longer exist um, caused by rising sea levels. So it's 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 a suppressing issue um, and one that 
unless we we really see the the action um, becomes more and more pressing every day. And the sad truth, of course, here is that these small islands have done so little to contribute to the broader challenge, and yet they're bearing the brunt, uh, and they're the first to to see the catastrophic impact of this. I've heard you quote one of your mentors by saying that resilience can be defined by islands. What does mitigation and adaptation look like in island states and developing nations? Yeah, no, you're spot on. I mean, islands, countries, all 39 of the members of the Alliance of Small Island States contribute less than 1% of greenhouse gases um, emissions uh, to the world. Um, in terms of mitigation, what does that look like? So mitigation is is an interesting one because mitigation is critical for everyone, right? So bring, curbing greenhouse gas um, emissions is of utmost importance. Um, every Everything flows from there, right? If you don't do it, <laughs> you have more a need for adaptation to adapt to the impacts and you have, of course, more loss and damage um, as a result. Um, but in, in, in island nations, we, we have... We have not said, oh, we won't make a difference if we, you know, install renewable energy. Um, and, and of course, these things are come at a cost. You know, we, we've not looked at it as we won't make a difference. We're one percent. In fact, we've seen it as an opportunity for leadership um, to be able to show the world, well, these things are possible. And we've been innovative. You know, my own island home, the Seychelles, we are now um, piloting the first ever floating solar farm um, in Africa. Um, so, so that's you know exciting things to to show the world that that uh, mitigation is possible. Uh, but of course, it's it's not just about that, right? I mean, we have to be we have to be realistic that most island nations are not a hundred percent powered by renewable energy, um, and we are very much heavily dependent on fossil fuels in order to to power our um, to power our um, systems. Um, and and for that reason, mitigation is also <laughs> is also critical for adaptation in the sense that um, it is less if if we're able to to be, to make use of the sun, the wind that we have, we're definitely saving money on spending that would typically go towards fossil fuel, um, and that in itself means that there is more money in the reserves to support adaptation efforts. Um, so in that respect, mitigation and adaptation all have always and we know go hand in hand. Now, as it relates to adaptation, um, adaptation is is one that you know all countries have to do. Um, we know that uh, climate change is, is happening. There is a need to adapt, and and countries must 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 do so. You know whether it means that the we we've got to find ways of of um, making our coral reefs more resilient, or whether it means that. We've got to build on higher ground or other forms of planning that we need to do. Either way, we need to uh, be able to to foresee um, the impacts that will will come, and then make sure that we're we're taking the necessary steps to adapt to that. And we've seen a lot of that in agriculture, where people have done climate smart farming um, and really working towards being more resilient um, to the impacts of climate change, because end of the day, it is a reality. Um, and, and of course, you know, we should not see it as uh, let's continue <laughs> emitting, we will just adapt more. Uh, that, that, of course, comes with its own bill. Uh, but, uh, the world at this point in time is finding very difficult to foot already. I want to dive deeper into the question around financing for all of this work. The Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust that you led in your home country of the Seychelles was the result of a $21.6 million from the world's first blue economy debt for nature swap in 2015. What went into landing that agreement and what did it enable? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the debt for nature swap is one example, you know, and it's, it's an example that people refer to as blended finance. And I mean, ultimately the, the thinking behind that is, how do you leverage public funds to attract private capital or philanthropy? And that's exactly what happened. Now, in terms of what what do you require and what did it enable? I mean, the first things first is political will, right? Um, I think in the Seychelles, uh, we have to be fair in attributing the leadership that came from the highest office when it came to um, ocean conservation and climate adaptation. Um, there were ambitious commitments that were that uh, the country was willing to make um, as a small island nation, even more so impressive. 
Um, and, and, and that's really, uh, you know, one of the key elements. I think the, the other elements that, that helps this come along is obviously the, the creditors who were believers <laughs> that this is something that could be possible and as well as key partnership. I think partnership were, were critical, whether it was with the external creditors who, who were willing and of course, these are financial transactions, you know, but other creditors did have a belief that this could really lead to something bigger, really lead to a, an example that others could follow. Um, you'll have other partners like the Nature Conservancy, who were, who's, of course, uh, an international NGO, have provided the expertise to be able to, to structure such a deal and be able to leverage their own network to mobilize the funds required to buy back the debt. In terms of what it was able to enable, um, so at this point in time, um, there is something called a Blue Grants Fund, which is a grants facility that is providing upwards of 700,000 US dollars uh, to local communities, um, to government agencies, to individuals to be able to also, you know, um, almost play their role, almost take their fate into their hands by taking action that is required, both in terms of ocean conservation and climate adaptation. Uh, so not only is it money available um, nationally inside the country, but it's it's bigger than that. It's really about empowering people to be able to to not look only outside, um, but to say that we too can play a role in in making sure that we we have a safe uh, future. And this breakthrough also led to the Seychelles protecting 30% of its waters, which is an area roughly the size of Germany. Should we think about financing for climate adaptation and marine protection together? Mm. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, so it led to the protection of 30% of the exclusive economic zone. And in terms of your question with regards to should we think of ocean conservation and climate adaptation together, I think it's it's important that we're, we're very <laughs> clear um, on on what is the equation of the effort, right? So when it comes to ocean conservation as a whole, right? So protecting swaths of ocean, um, the reality there is it's more linked to adaptation, right? So it's more linked to removing pressures on the ocean to be able to, to allow the ecosystems to recover, to be able to provide more uh, for the people. So it's a it's an adaptation um, effort. Now, when you talk about ocean conservation, but more so in the elements of focusing on critical urban ecosystems, and here we're talking about your mangroves, your seagrasses, then it's then it's got a mitigation potential and, and also co-benefits, but I'll take mitigation first. So when it comes to mangroves and seagrasses, we know that they perform this very important function where they're able to absorb and lock carbon away in their root system. Um, and that's that's mitigation value, right? This is a service that is a that that it performs for for the whole world. Um, and and yes, that is so. To, so to the extent that we're protecting those critical ecosystem, um, which are which is part and parcel of ocean conservation, it can definitely be linked to climate adaptation. But as I mentioned, we can't forget that. There's also an uh, an adaptation. I would I would I would term it as it's an adaptation action with mitigation co benefits. Um, but the adaptation action is of course seagrasses, mangroves act as nurseries for um for fish. It all fish species. It also acts as um habitats and and food. So in the, in that respect uh, for biodiversity. So so in that respect, I'd say that we can link the two. But I think we must be very clear as to what we are linking. And, and I want to put it over this way in the simplest form, which is ocean conservation by itself does not inherently have mitigation value, uh, which is something that we need to, to be careful about. Is there another way we should think about incentivizing or accelerating funding for protection of, of marine ecosystems? Other than the debt for nature swap, I mean, there are many... I think there are many creative <laughs> folks out there who are thinking about how to incentivize, um, how to incentivize marine protection and 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 providing the necessary financing for it. Because I think we need to be, you know, we need to be quite careful when we talk about ocean conservation. It's 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 a sensitive topic, you know, especially when a lot of that ocean conservation is often in developing country waters. 
So it's a sensitive topic. So when we talk about it, providing that incentive um, for financing, I think we need to to be creative in, in terms of, yes, not only debt for nature swaps. I mean, the Seychelles went on to have a blue bond, a sovereign blue bond. Um, there are already discussions about blue carbon markets. Um, there are discussions about tourism fees and levies. So I think the, the toolbox is full, but it varies in the different contexts of different countries. And of course, the political will um, to implement those. Uh, but I think there are financial options. Um, but at the same time, nothing is going to replace public funds. There was a major breakthrough last year at COP27 on the creation of a loss and damages fund. How important was this announcement and what responsibilities do wealthier nations with higher emissions have in funding these efforts? I mean, the loss and damage fund (laughs) is 30 years in the making. Um, This is something that uh, the Alliance of Small Island States have been pushing for a very long time. You know, something that we've uh, we've wanted to see because since 1991, Vanuatu, at the time leading EOSIS, had been very clear: we're facing loss and damage. We're going to face increasing loss and damage, and we need the necessary financing to to address that. It's it was a important decision as it provided hope and solidarity at a time that was much needed. Um, And I think in terms of questions on responsibility and liability, um, these are (laughs) these are difficult questions. These are questions that oftentimes in negotiations we we skirt around um, because we don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable because that's also unconducive to negotiations. Um, But at the same time, I think it's it's clear that um, the conventions and the agreements that we've signed before that there is an element of responsibility for those who have um, been polluting for a longer time, uh, what we call historical responsibility. Uh, But at the the same time, we are moving towards the language of solidarity um, because we are now all facing loss and damage. You know, this is no longer a small island state issue. This is no longer a developing country issue. We've seen the heat waves and the many things happening in developed countries. That's also affecting um, those countries. And, and they're facing loss and damage, um, but they have the resources to deal with it. Uh, we do not. And so there is a responsibility element, but there's also solidarity. For sure. I mean, when we last chatted, we were talking about the Bahamas and Prime Minister Davis there estimates that as much as 40% of Bahamian debt is actually attached to climate change. And you have these catastrophes like Hurricane Dorian in 2019, which added about three and a half billion dollars in loss and damages to the small island. Um, so it, it is pretty tough for some of these countries with much smaller GDPs and, and national economies to be able to catch up when they are faced with such a horrific and catastrophic example of climate change. Um, I do want to move a little bit more to broaden out and discuss the blue economy at large. What are some of the critical components of a thriving blue economy and some successful examples? You touched on this a little bit in an earlier answer, but mm. I was wondering if you could just sort of give folks a picture of, of what it means to, to have a blue economy. <laughs> it's a complicated question, Aaron. Um, <laughs> what does it mean to have a blue economy? So as everybody knows, let's start off with the fact that we don't actually have an <laughs> internationally agreed definition of the blue economy. So um, the blue economy is is one that um, that that is fluid, <laughs> but let me tell you what I think it is, and and maybe we can go from there. And I can also share some examples from the Seychelles. So I th- I think a blue economy is inherently linked to sustainability. Um, it is relooking at our current sectors and industries and really moving it and transitioning it to sustainable practices. Um, but in addition to that, one of the things that we've done. Um, as countries, as, as um, international communities, we operate very sectorally when it comes to the ocean. You know, we have fishing, which is dealt with under the Ministry of Fisheries, shipping under transport, and we don't have this cohesion and this integration that is inherently required of the ocean because the ocean itself biologically, ecologically does not operate in <laughs> sectors or, you know, fictitious lines that we've created under the law of the sea convention and things like that. So blue economy also is an opportunity for good governance. It's an opportunity for greater integration and coherence and a more holistic approach um, to the way in which we govern the ocean. 
so that's the foundation. And then from there, there has to be that element of sustainability. Um, and there are many, and you know, the, one of the big discussions around the blue economy is, you know, what sectors fall under the blue economy. In my humble opinion, for example, oil and gas does not fall under the blue economy. If it is inherently unsustainable and, you know, worse, <laughs> worse yet, as we all know, is leading to, to climate change, um, it, it cannot, in my mind, um, be part of the blue economy. Um, and those are those are tough discussions in terms of of you know what the direction countries go to, and I'm not one to impose what you know what countries' visions are for the blue economy, but uh, just a little bit on what my own view of the blue economy is. In an interview on Danny Washington's podcast, you talked about seeing pristine areas in the Seychelles being changed by the de- development of major international hotels. I wonder, sort of expanding on. Uh, this conversation around the blue economy, how should we think about balancing economic development with environmental conservation and also balancing foreign investment with local ownership? It's 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 all in the implementation, I think. Um, it's all in the implementation and it's also about tough decisions. Um, so for example, you know, when we say economic versus environment and, and oftentimes um, the blue economy somewhat promises you a triple win, right? So um, the triple win is you will automatically have uh, more economic uh, prosperity, uh, social equity, and ecological sustainability as part of the blue economy. But yes, you do see that on one hand in developing big hotels, um, and perhaps there's a question there, is that blue economy? <laughs> in uh, developing big hotels, it may affect um, areas that are very pristine. Um and I mean, in the Danny, in and with the conversation with Danny, I think it was uh, really along the lines of an area, a marsh, a marsh area that I knew very well had, you know, now a very uh, swanky boardwalk, um, and of course a lot of um, litter and and um, litter and, and pollution was coming coming from the hotel and more so the visitors from the hotel, I should say, um, and not pin it out necessarily with uh, to one to one uh, industry. And I and I think it's it's a, it's really in the how, right? It's really thinking about how we do things. Um, it's that EIA, it's that environmental impact assessment. You know what what yeah what EIA, what standards have we set nationally to ensure that these things aren't happening? That's step one. Um, it's the type of tourism. You know um, how many how many rooms do we want to have? And don't get me wrong here. These it's these are balancing acts, right? Because, you know, a lot of people will say, well, if you have very few rooms and it's a luxury destination and you want high, you know, products of that swinging high income, uh, what about tourism being less inclusive then, you know, and, and how does that affect other people who, who would like to travel but are not able to because we're creating a destination that's inex- inaccessible? Um, and and then so EIAs. Um, you know, thinking about what type of uh, industry and what type of tourism we have, um, but also, you know, also individual behavior. Um, there is no reason for that marshy land to have water bottles or plastic straws or whatever it is in there. Um, that is very much individual behavior. And, and here, in no way, blaming the tourists alone. I'm sure the local population that now use the boardwalk also have an impact on that. So to my mind, it's, it's really in the how and, you know, have we given enough thought to those bigger questions? Is it the right tourism? Um, are my laws and regulations when it comes to environmental impact assessment taking into consideration how um, seagrasses are, are, are going to be impacted by these coastal developments. Um, I can tell you for certain that um, in the Seychelles, for example, a country that is a blue economy leader um, at the moment only takes into consideration mangroves, right? So these are the evolutions that we really need to see. Last question on this thread. Uh, in a recent article on the blue economy in the Seychelles, you discussed the importance of governance when it comes to successful implementation. Can you share some of those lessons learned? Yeah, so governance is is key, you know, and I've and I've mentioned that I think it's it's ultimately the foundation. Um, one of the things is um, in terms of lessons learned is creating institutions. You know, um, the Seychelles created the blue economy um, department. That was inherently supposed to become this coordinating body that would be able to to 
make sure that we're more coordinated uh, and in this multi-sectoral space, but also to be able to advance sustainability across this multi-sectoral space. Uh, one of the findings I'd say is certainly that um, leadership, uh, bridge building um, and the bridge building nature of such departments is absolutely key. Um, we've in the Seychelles, uh, a lesson learned is um, how successful a blue economy department, which is intended to be a coordinating arm, can actually effectively um, coordinate multi multiple sectors. Uh, and here, one of the learnings I would certainly say is we definitely uh, we definitely um, require a legislative framework to support that, right? We definitely need a legislative framework to support that coordination. Um, and oftentimes, um, it's it's also people, right? It's also people. People are people are fearful of integration. You know, why is this person from this other office telling me to report to them? Why is this person from this office asking me to share the information that I have? Um, and I and I think that's that's something that um, we we often don't talk about. We just say it's difficult, uh, but we we often forget that human nature is is perhaps what I've seen in my readings of Belize, Seychelles, uh, one of the things that is actually hindering that integration. We've covered a lot of ground, and and um, I just want to bucket my last two questions together, um, which are. What are you most excited about right now in the ocean and climate sector? And how might the general public get engaged in these efforts? Ooh, what am I most excited about? Um, that's a great question. Well, I think I'm, 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 mo- I'm most excited about the innovations that are coming out. I, I, as, as much as I work in the multilateral space and a very negotiations-oriented space, we must not forget that People on the ground are doing things, you know, um, just got an invitation recently from, I think it's the Ocean Innovation Summit in Africa, and in, in, that's going to take place in, in South Africa this um, in next month. And that's really exciting, you know, really seeing the innovations that's taking place um, on the ground uh, as, it, as it relates to um, all aspects of the blue economy, right? So as it relates to technology, as it relates to um, in addition to tech, as it relates to innovations, trying out new things in terms of governance, coming up with fi- new financial deals, we've seen now that the debt for nature swap has been scaled up in Belize. It's been scaled up in Bar. It's been replicated in Barbados. Um, you know, there's some really exciting things happening. Um, but one of the things that I'm most interested in, of course, is bridging that financing gap. Um, and I think. Yeah, there. I think there are many questions there. I think things need to move from pilot, small scale to, to something far more robust. Well, thank you so much, Angelique, for sharing all of your experience and insights. And I just have to say, in the short period of time that I've known you, I've, I've been incredibly impressed by your ability to connect both the knowledge and realities of what's happening on the ground with larger systems and structures to scale this work in support of communities all around the world. And so I, I really value every time I get a chance to chat with you. And I so appreciate you sharing all of this with the audience. No worries, Aaron. Thank you very much. And it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much, Angelique, for sharing lessons learned from your work with small islands and communities in all corners of the planet. I'll leave links to where you can find Angelique and the Alliance of Small Island States in the show notes, which you can find at only.one forward slash upwell. Once again, that's only.one forward slash upwell. This week's episode was engineered by Jake Bowles. Research was supported by Serena Cooper. And our cover art was designed by Joanna Marcus at Only One. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And start your journey to help save the ocean and fix the climate today at Only.One. For as little as $9, you can start planting coral and mangroves and removing plastics and carbon. Again, that's www.only.one. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll be back next week with an all-new episode of Upwell. Upwell.